What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And this is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders including today, Robin Smith, which we'll talk about in a second. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. Today, I'm very excited. We have Robin H. Smith, because there are a lot of probably Robin Smiths out there. He's co-founder of Virtual Logistics with Scott Beaver. The company was founded in 1994, and they help businesses take the software they use and allow them to communicate with one another so the company never has to move data manually. This obviously prevents human errors and ultimately money. And we're going to talk about a case where I think you were talking to someone earlier today where they have five people typing in things manually. Um, Virtual logistics allows e-commerce business owners to not only focus on running and growing their businesses, but to accelerate their growth. Robin, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. So you don't have to name the company. So this company you're talking to has five people yeah, manually entering things. You're, you heard it right. So, um, yeah. So think of that. Think of that. Um, they've got people pounding the keyboard. Uh, from 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock at night, probably having a smoke break, having a lunch break, and a coffee break. Somebody comes along, asks them a question, they make a mistake. Um, The industry standard for the manual processing of an order from start to finish, so order, invoice, and shipment, is about 60 bucks. Right. So you you figure what the the potential cost of a data error is, and you f- figure what the cost of that company is of having all of those orders manually yeah. entered. Now, what we see today, which is really interesting, is you'll see this hodgepodge of some channels are manually entered into the order management system, others mm-hmm. are tightly, tightly integrated because the platform that's been chosen has that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a scalable solution. What's yeah. something, when you're talking to a company like this, obviously you have a lot of solutions to integrate. What's something for them that they thought they had to manual, manually enter, but you know, you told them, no, there's an actual integration that'll integrate this and that together? Well, it's more, it's more that they don't know that it can be integrated. That's right. really not the issue because, you know, if you think about it, most people are, uh, uh, you know, have come out of the app world. I, I absolutely hate Steve Jobs for, for creating the app concept because the app concept, what it does is it takes a very complex process and simplifies it into like that, that app McNugget that, that, that everybody understands and it's either free or there's a low price associated with it, but it's putting you into that lowest common denominator. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work for everybody. So people are, people are, people are sensitized now, well, well there's got to be an app that, that allows me to connect this to this. Um, as you scale in an e-commerce business and as you get more channels in your mix, you are going to run into situations where you, there is no app for, for, for certain things. Right, right. So what ends up happening is that people it will integrate those that are easy to integrate. Mm-hmm. Um, they may not necessarily be the highest volume channels. And the ones where there quote unquote is no app, they'll either leave it alone with no integration or they'll go out and they'll try and find some programmer um, you know using one of the freelance boards to try and do it themselves and what ends up happening is that you get all these sort of like band-aids that are applied and it's not that people don't know that they they can integrate it's that they know they can integrate it's just they don't know how to go about creating that data strategy or that strategy around 
tying all of these things together. So what are the most common integrations? Like I'm sure you see like Shopify and Amazon Seller Central. What do people use Shopify? How do they integrate Shopify with virtual logistics? How do they use you to, well, to we communicate? Were, you know, and that's an interesting question because if you think of most integrations today, um, they're point they're point to point. I'm connecting uh, Amazon to my accounting software. I'm connecting Shopify to my accounting software. Um, our approach is completely different. Yeah. We we can do point to point. That's not a problem, but. We believe that where e-commerce is going with this multi-channel world is that it's really a model of point to many right. or many to one. So if you think about it, when we take a feed off of Shopify, I have the ability now in my platform and our service to go out to many different applications, not just Shopify to this. Mm -hmm. Shopify to that. It's really, I bring the data in, I normalize it, and I can now push it out to wherever that data has to go. Mm -hmm. So it could be an order management platform. You may want to take the customer information and uh, throw that into your marketing automation platform. Um, maybe you don't need all the information that's in Shopify. Maybe you've got multiple warehouses that you want to deal with and your order management system can only handle one well you need that order management that order in your order management system but maybe now we split the orders geographically and we push it out to the various 3PLs so depending on what the application mix and what the business model is we now can tailor that that integration to the way the business runs right as opposed to trying to shoehorn you into well I want to connect this to this and this to this which is usually point to point, right? So, so in this case, Shopify, you know, could you could have it integrate with Amazon Seller Central, but you could have it integrate if someone has this three PL on the West Coast and there's an order from the West Coast, it sends it there. If on the East Coast there's a three PL, it sends it to the East Coast, or yeah. you can send them to your, you know, accounting software or whatever Correct. information you want it sent. Yeah, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. Wouldn't do your first scenario, which is Shopify to Seller Central. Hmm. Um, and, and that's a totally separate conversation because that was something that Magento started pr promoting in 2013 of trying to make the shopping cart like the central point of truth for everything. Um, Shopify, and we are strategic partners with Shopify, they've just announced uh, a product feed up to uh, Amazon. And I, you know, from a business perspective, I totally know why they're doing it. It makes perfect sense. But as a seller, I think strategically you really need to think about whether that's the best approach for you yeah. or whether you keep those channels as separate entities. Because let's... If, yeah, so yeah, walk me through that, what you mean by that. Well, the reason to... In most cases, the reason that people will, will want to use their shopping cart uh, product information to feed other channels is that the requirements are fairly standard across the board in these omni-channel channels um, for information. So, for example, you you know you got to have your public-facing URL for your images. You're going to have your some of your SEO tags. Your order management platform may not have that. But the bigger issue here is not so much where it's sitting. It's that you don't have a product strategy. Your product strategy really should be driven out of a, a PIM type product where you have a central point of truth for your product information and you now push that out to the channel as you need it as opposed to trying to manage it within a shopping cart platform. And because your shopping cart is a shopping cart. And so the other question you need to ask, and I've seen this actually have, have really negative impacts, is that what's going to be the impact on your shopping cart, on the customer experience? A lot of people don't think of the interaction with the customer and what all this other back and forth on the back end is doing to the actual functionality of the, of the cart. Is it slowing down the process? Is it, creating, is it creating all sorts of other issues that you're not even aware of but that the customer is feeling? I, I had one agency say to me, well, we'll, we'll just we'll just load more rack space space into it. Well, somebody's paying for that. 
Um, is it because the agency is making money promoting the the hosting certs? Um, so it's 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 these kind of things, and I think the theme here that that I see developing is really not having a a, a plan on how you're going to implement technology within your 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 business, and and how you're going to handle each one of the channels. And it's really well, I've got this. I want to make it this to talk to that, and really it should come to this. And as opposed to stepping back and saying, okay. This is how I want my business to run, and here are the channels that I'm selling to. Because what happens if, for example, um, you all of a sudden decide you want to change your shopping cart, and you got everything in and out of your shopping cart? You're up the creek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen that. I've seen that where a company, ha they came to us, and we rebuilt their entire integration stack for them to separate everything out because they had a fight with their agency, with their e-com agency, and everything was in and out of their shopping cart. Hmm. They were doing Amazon, eBay, they were doing a whole Was it a custom shopping cart or were they using... No, no, they were using a Magento platform. Hmm. So, you know, it could be Magento, it could be Shopify, it could be BigCommerce, but I think that's a strategy that um, makes sense. And usually it's a reflection of, of two things. One... I don't really have an overall strategy of how I'm going to run my business. And the second is a lack of sophistication <clears throat> in the application stack and in the business process on the back end. Mm -hmm. that's, that's primarily what we see. Yeah. You know, one thing that I, in one of the talks I watched of you, which I really liked, was um, you talk about mapping the experience. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about that in a second. But... What are some of the other common integrations that you get requests for or that that you do on a daily basis? Well we do we do we do three primary order channels if if you want to look at the front end. Yeah, so go we ahead. do we do shopping carts. So mm -hmm. we'll do Shopify, Magento, mm -hmm. Volution, Big Commerce, Lemon Stand. I mean there's at IRCE last year I counted eighty discrete shopping cart right. platforms. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've done Woo, we've done Open Commerce, so th th those are they. Yeah. We do um, we do marketplaces, so things like uh, Best Buy Marketplace in Canada. We do Amazon. Um, marketplaces are interesting because you have now this transition into the, the 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 major retailer marketplaces. So like the the Costco dot com, like Walmart, um, Walmart dot com. This now comes into traditional bricks and mortar EDI, which mm. is where we started, right. and we still do a lot of EDI. So we we can handle those three channels, and then on the taking that order data and satisfying the return flow, you think about the back end of your supply chain. How do you manage that order? How do you invoice that order? Um, how do you pick, pack, and ship that order? Uh, where do you get your inventory information from? So all of these various data flows can now be integrated. Mm -hmm. And as your business scales and gets more sophisticated, I come back to this 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 model of having a plan of how you're where is information going to come from so that you're satisfying the demands because one of the really interesting things and this is this is something that we see uh that has come out of the EDI world where compliance and chargebacks and vendor demands were were always very strict and very rigid. You're starting to see that now in the e-commerce world in the marketplaces. If you look at Jet.com, for example, the requirements they put on their their uh, their vendors, it's reminiscent of what we traditionally see in the UI world. So, if you don't have a strategy, if you're just trying to plug things together, um, you're gonna you're gonna end up falling flat in your face, or you're gonna you're gonna have dissatisfied customers. So. You have two things to come back to your question about mapping the customer experience because I think it's really, really critical. Mapping the customer experience to me means two things. One, if you're a pure play e-commerce, it's what is what does your brand represent and what do you what's the experience you want to engender with your customer? Right. How do you how do you want your customer to feel about you as a brand? You know, I we've got lots of examples. We've all had examples of going on a website and ordering a product and you don't know whether it's ever going to show up. Uh, 
I just ordered some fountain pens from China. Uh, <laughs> but I did them. I did them. I did them not through Goulet. I ordered them through okay. Amazon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you know, because I wanted to see what they were. I'm doing it through Amazon because I don't want to deal directly with China because I don't know if I'm ever going to get my product. Right. So that's a trust relationship. On the flip side of that, you've got the other side of that, which is the the experience you have with your vendor that's Im that is imposing compliance on you because each one of them has a scorecard on you. And if you're not satisfying that that customer experience, yeah. you're going to end up getting yourself into big trouble. Yeah. So that's why I say mapping out the customer experience to me is really, really important. Yeah. And we'll talk specifically about that. So. But from the, the integration standpoint, you said the shopping carts, the marketplaces. Was there one more that you deal with? Uh, the bricks and mortar EDI. Oh, bricks and mortar EDI. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, is, is, is another whole integration strategy. And then into the ERP in the back end, uh, logistics companies, marketing automation, mm -hmm. um, we also do. So we do things like Infusionsoft. We do CRMs like ProsperWorks. Uh, we've done HubSpot, for example. So, you know, these are all sorts of. It's really, what's the application mix within a company's um, application stack and, and what they use to run their business? And this is actually a very important one because what I find more and more is that people, people don't think about integratability when they're choosing their applications. Right. right, not at all. They look for that app, but they don't look whether to see whether there's an API. Um, I had one recently where company wanted to integrate and they were running the basic level of an order management platform and if you went on the company's website they talked about how great their API was well it wasn't available until the next tier up and you were and their spend was on the order of about two thousand dollars a month and it was a showstopper so they couldn't integrate they weren't it, it just wasn't possible so that's the kind of thing people need to think beyond just oh there's an app for that so <laughs> So what's the ideal customer that should be using virtual logistics? The ideal customer is one that's got between five and seven apps in their, uh, in their, in their stack, and that can be a combination of order management, logistics, um, and channels. Um, what we see is people who are doing bricks-and-mortar EDI using web portals. Mm -hmm. We see people doing Amazon whether it's vendor central or seller central, using the portal. Uh, they may be selling to Walmart and using uh, Orbit, which is Walmart's portal. Um, so people that are using portals, a lot of manual process or partial integrations, those kind of things allow you to, you know, you know, allow us to come in and say, okay, let's map out how we want all these things to talk to each other. What are the compliance requirements, first of all? Because to come back to what we were saying, you're going to have your e-com customer experience if you're selling that channel. But you're also going to have that compliance requirement if you're selling into those kinds of channels as well. You know, you think of, of Amazon. Um, if you're on Vendor Central, I mean, you have certain requirements in terms of how fast a, an order confirmation goes back, uh, your daily inventory snapshot, and so on and so forth. These are imposed by Amazon. On Seller Central, you have the same sort of thing. I mean, if you don't keep your, your inventory and your pricing up to date um, and you, you overcommit, you're going to get blacklisted. Yeah. So these are all the things that need to be, need to be looked at with each one of these individual channels. Yeah. So it goes beyond, to come back to it, it goes really beyond just connecting them together. Yeah. It's really thinking about well, what's the strategy you're going to use for those. Yeah. I mean, Robin, it seems like you deal with really more sophisticated e-commerce businesses. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, what, is there like a like typical, they have X number of employees or X amount of revenue that people come to you? You know, because obviously someone could have five to seven apps or channels and maybe they're not that big, they're not ready for what you do. Yeah. Um, I, I, think, I think there's two criteria that I look for in terms of people, one is uh, is is obviously the app mix, but it's more not so much the the value of the orders; it's the order volume, um, the break even or the point at which integration must be considered is twenty five orders a day. Mm -hmm. If you're below twenty five orders a day, eh, you're probably going to be 
doing it enough to 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 do it manually because that's going to ebb and flow. It's not going to be a constant constant twenty five orders. If you're doing a constant twenty five orders a day, um, then you really should be looking at it, at some form of integration. Um, I'll give you an example. One of our customers over Black Friday, Cyber Monday off Walmart.com, they were getting between 60 to 100 orders every 15 minutes. Wow. 60 to 100 every 15 minutes. Minutes. And if they were doing that manually, they would never have been able to keep up with, or even with partial integration, with all the downstream requirements that go with that order cycle, they would never have been able to keep up with the flow. So it's a combination of order volume, what are the compliance requirements, what are the requirements to get information back to the retailer or back to the marketplace, um, and how fast that information has to come back. And keeping in mind that things are getting more complex, supply chains are getting tighter and more real-time requirements, and that the demands for information are only increasing, they're not decreasing. Because if you put yourself in the, in, in the place of marketplace, for example, if we use Amazon, the customer experience that they're using your data for to generate, um, if you can't provide that, that data in a timely manner, you're not going to be, you're not going to be selling them for very long. Yeah. So, so you know, that's why I, I, I say mapping that experience is really no different on an e-commerce site than it is selling to a marketplace. It's what is the data you have to provide? How fast do you have to provide it? How many hoops do you have to jump through? Like, are you cutting and pasting into a spreadsheet to provide Amazon with your inventory? Well, is that really that efficient? I mean, you may have 100 orders a week, but it's taking you three days to generate that inventory file because you're pulling data from like six different sources, that's a candidate for for doing some form of integration or at least looking at how you can tie that, that into a more efficient flow. Yeah. So I don't really use dollar volume because we have sites that don't do an awful lot of um, dollar volume transactionally wise, but they have sufficient complexity within their supply chain that they have enough apps to do that, to connect, to have them all talking to each other manually, just is, is overwhelming. Yeah. So, so it's a, per, perhaps a little bit different way of looking at it, but I think that's that's a better way because that gives you a better perspective on where the growth is within your channels. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've been we've all been taught from an accounting perspective to look at the P and L and to look at where we're making the most money on our orders, rather than looking at how much. Um, complexity there is and how we satisfy them. And I think that's a that's a really really important thing to look at as 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 an organization scales. Yeah. But I'm going to talk about mapping the experience. I'm going to have you re like reset the video. Just push the video off and on because it looks like it's still catching up. Like it was a little pixelated for a second. Um, yeah. Because well, push it's, the it's, if you push the video off and then on so it just kind of resets it because i think it's uh it was working with some bandwidth issues so i want to be able to make sure people hear you okay the um the order mapping the customer experience there's a there's a perfect um infographic or there's a perfect graphic that's out on uh the web if you do if you do a google search for the uh the e-commerce order cycle there's a, it's a fantastic thing. It looks like a, it looks like a snakes and ladders kind of, kind of graphic with little squares where things are going from one to the other. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, it's an absolute perfect circle. The order comes in, it goes through, it goes out to shipment. Uh, the, you know, there's a little, you know, guide pack in the box. The truck goes out. I mean, how realistic is that? <laughs> right. How, how many times have you placed an order and gotten an email saying, well, your shipment is going to be delayed or you're going to, we don't have the stock or so on and so forth. So there is no such thing as a perfect order cycle. What there is, is you've got to map what that cycle is within your own business and right. you've got to go and you've got to identify where you need to have touch points to be able to go back to your customer and say, you know what, we're having a problem. 
uh, here's some information, this is what we think is going to happen, or you're providing information to somebody else. If you're doing vendor dropship, for example, for a retailer, um, some retailers actually require you to provide information at every step of the process where that order is. Right. Um, if you think of Lowe's, for example, in their e-com model, that's what they do. So mapping that order um, process, if you think of the e-commerce world, what do you want to engender with your customer? You think of the marketplaces and the e-com uh, platforms, what is being imposed on you and how are you going to provide the data to satisfy that experience? And I think that's, that's key. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's why I like when you talk about mapping experience because I feel like everyone can just do that and find some interesting things maybe they're not doing or not doing right. Um, what are, and you probably get really deep into this with companies because you're looking at integrating all their tools together. So what are some of the big mistakes you find people are making in their e-commerce business? Um, that's a good one. Um, one, of the, one of the big ones we find, which is a, which is a killer on scorecards um, in the marketplaces, is um, relying on too much cutting and pasting into spreadsheets. It's so time-consuming and it's so error-prone. Now, a lot of people do that because they, um, they're getting their data, their inventory data from maybe two or three different sources, and they're having to manually knit all this data together. Um, and then they do an upload up to the portal. So you think of Amazon, for example. I do an, a manual upload to the portal of my inventory, and there's mistakes. Well, what's the impact of that? I don't realize that those mistakes are there because I'm cutting and pasting. And What's the impact now in my relationship with Amazon? Um, that kind of thing, I think, is something that people need to step back and think about it. Sure, that's how you're doing it right now, but is that the best way for you to scale your business? Um, the other thing that we see is um, a lot of people are, they want integration, but they're not willing to spend the time to dissect their processes. And because they're not willing to dissect their processes, they don't understand uh, the complexity they have within their own businesses. Mm -hmm. They pay lip service to it. So there's a, you know, where I can do it, um, I will often get everybody in bigger companies, often get everybody who deals with an order in a room, in, in a conference room, and I'll take a ball of wool and I'll say, let's start with the first person that touches that order. Mm. Pass the ball of wool around to every, or a ball of string, whatever you want. Right. And pass it around to everybody in the room in the sequence that they touch that order. And you want a visual of how complex processes can be within an organization. Do you have pictures of that? That's interesting. Um, I don't. I, I, I can dig something out. Oh, no. I, I think you should take a, after you're done with that meeting, I think you need to take a picture of what that web looks like. Well, a lot yeah. of people don't want pictures because they're embarrassed. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if it's something to be embarrassed about, but there just needs to be something to connect them all, right? Well, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. So what have you uncovered in someone's business that they were surprised about that really helped as far as integrating something that they didn't realize could even be integrated? Um, I don't think it's, it's, they were surprised that it couldn't be, that they, they, that it was integrated. It was more, um, they were surprised at how we could streamline processes and mm -hmm. how we could simplify things. I think that was the bigger aha kind of moment, is that um, coming with a different perspective on how to do things, you know, because you think of most business I see. people, you know, and I'm a victim of it too. I mean, you're so engrossed in how your business works that you don't step back and, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, you don't step back and think about how you go about doing things. It just becomes routine. And unless somebody from the outside is looking at us saying, man, that's a stupid way of doing something. Hmm. Have, you, have you thought of changing the yeah. orientation? So without naming names, what's, <laughs> what's something that maybe they were taking six steps and you're like, no, you only need to do these two steps or whatever. You simplified the process. What was some? Yeah, one of the ones that we did, one of the probably the best examples we did, and this is a few years ago now, 
um, we we did for a for a company that uh, provides uh, animal feed. Okay. Um, animal feed is highly regulated because they put hormones and antibiotics into it and everything else. So. Um, they were what they were doing was they were customizing the price list for each customer. So each so you would come to me and you'd say, I want this kind of fee, I want wheat and barley and rye, and I want this antibody, I want these hormones in it. Da, da, da. So it's a, so it's your special formula, right? Right, right. And the next guy would come and he'd have his special formula. And but this is all being formulated within an application. And what they were doing was taking the output of the application and cutting it, pasting it into a spreadsheet to then create a Word document with the customized price list for the customer. And what we did for them was we, we took the, the feed right out of the application that did these recipes and went from that straight to the price list. Mm. And what was a three-day process now became a half-an-hour process. So that that's the kind of thing where you take those steps, and and it was because they had always done it that way. That was the way that they built their their weekly price list. Because animal feed is a commodity, right? And the the commodity prices change on a daily basis. So every week they were putting out a new price list. So that's a good example. But I think there's, I, I mean, I think in any business you can you can go through and you can find uh, find examples like that. So, Raman, do people usually hire virtual logistics to do this complexity one time and it's a one-time type of fee? Or is it a monthly thing where we set up these things that run monthly? Um, we have two components. We have an onboarding component, which is um, let's set up the integration according to your business requirements. The assumption is your business rules make sense. The way you run your business makes sense. We'll tell you if, if there are things you, that you're not doing the way we think or that could be done better. Yeah, if you can improve it, yeah. Yeah, um, because we, we, we do want to improve people's business because yeah. we're all about accelerating growth. So we will. The, there's an onboarding component. And what that does is it allows us to take our stock connectors and, and customize them by applying the business rules. Then we, then we have a SaaS fee to run those and to monitor those. And the assumption is your business is not static, that it's going to change. So you may have... Um, you may have um, um, business rules or business things that change over time. Um, we had one with a customer recently where they added FedEx as a shipper. So we added into the integration some logic and some, some business rules around how their FedEx shipments would go. So that becomes a modification to the, to the, uh, to the process. And that we charge in the same way that we do the onboarding for. Or there may be something you want to turn off. Maybe there's a channel you don't use anymore. Right. But having it come through a central point uh, allows you now to turn things off and on as your business changes. As opposed to if you think back to what we were talking about earlier of having everything coming through your shopping cart, where what happens if you decide you don't like your shopping cart provider anymore and you've got, you got all these channels now coming into your shopping cart you're kind of in a difficult situation. Yeah. So, the other thing that you talk about with mapping experience, you do something really interesting with your company is you have the staff actually map out their experience during the holiday times when they're purchasing things. Yeah, we've we've done that at Christmas yeah. time. So um, I'm wondering what you found. What have people found with the breakdowns with their customer experience? Um. Let me give you some context because yeah. I think I think it's important. One of the things that, that that we find in the sales cycle is that everybody thinks they're on the e-commerce side. Everybody thinks they're the way that you come and interact with my site is perfect. Right. I'm going to give you the, the best. best. Of, right. Yeah, I'm the best. Ours is the most optimal. Speedy checkout, the whole nine yards. Um, so. A couple of years ago, we decided we were gonna we were gonna start collecting people's stories from the office. Everybody buys for Christmas, sure. uh, so what I did was I had everybody in the office collect their stories, and we do this on an annual basis. Um, and we 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 dissect the story and the experience to see where things break down. And usually, when they break down, what we see is uh, the intersection of manual processes. 
So I'll give you an example. Um, we ordered, we went up to my dad's place for Christmas. He lives in the eastern townships of Quebec, right on the Vermont border. Um, my sister was coming up from Rhode Island. Uh, so the house was full. We needed new mattresses. We went online and ordered these foam mattresses from Ikea. And we got a shipment notice um, saying they were going to be shipped on such and such a day by FedEx. And then total radio silence. A month later, get this. This, is, this blew me away when I got this. A month later, we get a shipment notification saying your order has been delivered. Well, it was, or it was delivered three weeks before. Mm. We already knew it was delivered. So I think what's happening on the IKEA side is that there somebody is going to FedEx, culling that information and manually entering it into their system, which then triggers a process to send it out. So it's that kind of thing that we often see and we dissect. We do have an ebook that we put out uh, that where we dissected, I think, Walmart, Toys R Us, uh, Corksicle, and uh, Aaron's Sweater Market in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I will say Aaron has subsequently changed their e-commerce site. I had a long chat with them about it. Um, the managing director, I, I, I gave him a heads up saying that we were going to publish this. And he was very appreciative, actually. And uh, they've since changed their website. So, uh, so you know, there's some value in that. But I think having somebody go out and, and try your, your process and see what happens and give you that feedback, really valuable. Yeah. So, so then do you call Ikea and be like, why aren't you using virtual logistics? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I'm being serious, though. Like, like does someone from the, your staff reach out to someone like that? Like, something's broken in your system, or do you just kind of chalk it up to... Yeah. I, I use it as an example in conferences, okay. and everybody gets a good chuckle, and if there's somebody from Ikea in the audience, then perfect. <laughs> Uh, no, because it's interesting. You know, it, it's very valuable to have someone go through the onboarding process. And like you said, with your onboarding portion, you know, someone could do nothing. If, if they just went through that onboarding process, they would probably improve their business just by things they're not doing also. Because, I mean, you talked about the Aaron sweater. I think it was because you ordered a sweater, right? Yeah, yeah I was looking for, you know, one of those nice uh, hand hand-knitted Irish sweaters. It's cold in Canada in the wintertime. Um, <laughs> so, and, you know, they're hard to find here, and they're super expensive. Um, so I ordered, and um, I actually liked the sweater I got, but I ordered one for my dad as well. So I had a second order coming through. And, and I had a different experience with them each time, mm. and each time it was a different thing that broke in the, the process, which absolutely to me highlighted how much manual work was going on in the background and when i talked to them um what was it that broke on each instance well what it was on the one um at one point the phone number had been transcribed incorrectly so that when dhl reached out to me i didn't get the message mm. um the second one was the i had asked to have the shipment not sent to my home but rather to my office, and they reversed the addresses. So, you know, that's somebody entering stuff manually. So looking at your site, and you profile a few companies that you work with, um, Zippo, Danison, Golda's Kitchen, Chapman's. Um, what kind of stuff do you do for Golda's Kitchen? What is Golda's Kitchen? Golda's that struck me as interesting. Gold, Golda's Kitchen is a really cool little store. Um, they have an e-commerce play, yeah. um, so they're, they've, got a, they've got a website, and they've got a retail outlet. What do they sell? Kitchen supplies. Oh, kitchen supplies, okay. You want all-clad pots and pans, you want uh, KitchenAid, blenders, they sell all that stuff. Um, so we do the integration between their Magento site and their, um, uh, their, uh, their ERP, their accounting system, and that's very highly integrated, so we do all sorts of real-time data movement for them. Again, gets beyond the plug-and-play. Mm -hmm. um, Danison is an actually an interesting one. They sell toothpicks. 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 Um, Danison sells sells flavored toothpicks. Now these That's guys. Cool. Yeah, oh yeah, no, these guys are these guys are something else. 
um, they are they sell they sell in they sell to the monocle shops um, if you're familiar with the monocle magazine uh, they sell to Fortnum and Mason in the UK a very high end luxury retailer uh, they sell to um, all sorts of uh, men's boutiques where you're going in and buying you know high end clothes um, they'll have the buy the cash so it's one of those impulse buys. Uh, malt f scotch flavored uh, toothpicks mm. um, and if you look at their stuff it's all very nicely done in, in little bottles with you know the old style um, tax uh, labels on top of the cork yeah uh, um, it's, it's really really nicely mm. done they sell all over the world how did they find you or you find them um, they found us uh, they were using an order management platform, and their order volume had reached the point where um, they needed integration to a variety of um, channels, and the order management platform was said they could do it. Um, they realized quite quickly that the box the order management platform was trying to put them in uh, was a, a canned integration lowest common denominator across all the customers and it was not going to satisfy the way they wanted to do business and uh, they wanted something to allow them to have a lot more control over the data um, and uh, as a result they ended up scrapping the order management platform and implementing a, an ERP package and that gave them the ability now to have control over the way the data was actually going to be used. Interesting. Because uh, they do a lot more with the data than just simply uh, simply passing the transactional information. So, so that, the, the, you know, the, there's an example of they had already mapped the, the customer experience. The owner had come into our office and we had whiteboarded it. And, uh, you know, he, he, he laid out what he, how he wanted the ideal scenario to work. And we went through, critiqued it, and I said to him, I said, I don't think you're going to be able to do it with your, your current platform. You're going to have to think about this, this, and this. And he went away and mulled it over and finally came back around and said, okay, I'm ready to do this. They had to change platforms. Yeah. That's a big decision, right? It was a big decision, but I think you're going to see more and more in the e-commerce world, a lot of companies are getting to the point where they've got the growth and the scale that they've gone with what's available and now they've got to start rethinking their strategy about their application stack. We're seeing that more and more and more. What platforms was he considering? I don't remember the mm. name of the platforms, frankly. It's been two years now. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of interesting businesses that probably cross your desk, like the flavored toothpicks. What's another interesting business where you just thought, I can't believe someone created a whole business out of this? Um, the one, the one that we had, the one that we had the most ethical discussion around whether we should even entertain, um, was a guy who uh, who was doing um, who was doing porno videos and uh, adult toys, and we decided that we talked to the employees about it and asked them whether they wanted to be engaged in that. Because you can't, you can't, you can't just ask your employees to do that, and the consensus was no, they didn't want to work with somebody like that. Yeah, and we walked. You know away. when the word ethical enters into the conversation, <laughs> there's something gray. Yeah, um, I mean most most businesses are fairly pedestrian, right? <laughs> you know, like Chapman's makes ice cream and <laughs> Ollie Berte makes shoes. Um, Where's Chapman's yeah, based out of? Chapman's is uh, north of Toronto. Okay. So they, you know, so, so yeah, that was probably the one with the, uh, you know, with the porno videos was probably. That's interesting because if something's messed up in their process, it melts, right? I mean, what, if something goes wrong in, in Chapman's process? Yeah, they're selling, they're selling to the major retailers. So the, it, so there's a cold chain component in their uh, process. Um, that's more of a logistical issue. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a. You know, it's a, it's certainly a concern. What they've got to deal with more is timeliness of data and compliance, making sure that 
the relationships they have, that customer experience with their vendor, mm -hmm. that they're satisfying that. So. Robin, do you also come across a lot of software and tools because you have to integrate with them. You're also hearing about different ones because people are using them. What are some of the, I know you can't give like a endorsement of any one, but what are some of the um, most common popular software and tools that you find people are using and you could maybe under the shopping cart or marketplace or whatever you find yeah. is very popular now um, that maybe someone it's, isn't using. Yeah, it's, it's, that's an interesting one because I think you have to look at the vertical. Um, there are some verticals where there's very uh, vertical specific applications like um, recently I talked to a company that was um, selling phones and there's a whole provisioning platform that they use. Well, I mean, somebody selling to Amazon maybe that sells phones might use that. Um, we have a we have a business uh, that sells in the musical instrument marketplace. They came up with marketplaces we had never even heard of, like Reverb.com and, and stuff like that. I mean, never even heard of these things. They're so specialized. I think that... If you look at, I, I, I would rather turn your question around, I think, and I'd look at what are the, um, rather than naming at applications, it's looking at the technology that those applications have. Because I think that we're in this world that's, that's transitioning from legacy old school apps to cloud-based SaaS, SaaS apps. And what you've got is you've got, You've got the ones that are pure legacy, the ones that are hybrid, where they're trying to they're trying to make that transition. And then you got the pure SaaS play guys. The pure SaaS play guys, um, what I look for is a public-facing API mm -hmm. that has documentation, because the first thing we look at is what can I do with that application. So I had one recently where somebody came to me and said, "I'm considering this application. They have a public-facing API." I want to do this, this, and this. And I said, you can't do it. Their API doesn't support it. So right away, that was off the list. I, I think it's better to approach things from that perspective. In the API world, is it a REST-based API or is it a SOAP-based API? It's a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive to integrate to a SOAP-based API than it is to a REST-based API. People don't realize it, but there's a lot more complexity when you get into OAuth and, and the whole back and forth associated with SOAP. So in 1994, what did, it, what did it look exist. like when you started this company? Uh, what did it look like? Well, there was no internet. Um, well, it was just, no, that's not true. There was the internet, but it was, it was DARPA. Okay. Uh, it was uh, dial-up modems. We started with uh, uh, um, 1,400 baud dial-up modems. We then went to 72, 14, 4, and so on. Um, we used to use PC Anywhere to connect to our customers' computers. So it was really computer to computer. Um, we used, for, for customer support, we used bulletin board software, BBS software. Your, your, older, uh, your older listeners will, will know exactly what I'm saying. Your younger ones are going, oh my God, <laughs> this guy's a dinosaur. Um, I, I, I actually always bug my boys that I remember the first hard drives that came out that were made by Winchester, and they were five megabytes, and they were like six inches tall. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're talking about terabytes. So, right. Uh, so no, so, so it, it was very primitive. It was very difficult. It was very expensive to connect to people. Um, if you had to sell to Walmart, for example... We used to uh, we used to use uh, thirty two seventy bisynchronous modems, and the last one we bought as a company cost us about thirty five hundred bucks, wow. uh, and, and that and because you were talking to Walmart's mainframe, so <laughs> that's how it's changed. How did you meet Scott? Scott and I worked at uh, CN. Uh, we worked in a division of CN called Canac Telecom. And CN is Canadian National Railways. Um, CN was a was a funny company because they were they had their fingers in everything. They had they owned phone companies, they owned a software group, uh, they owned part of Air Canada at the time. Um, they owned part of the Telesat. Telesat was Canada's satellite carrier. 
Um, and when they were mandated to privatize and become a private company because they were government owned, um, they started closing down assets. And Scott and I worked at Canac. Um, Canac was like a retirement home for CN, um, except that they retirement they, home. they sold they sold all the old railway stock around the world, um, and they had the software division, and we were selling their their phone company billing software. So. Uh, and we were selling that around the world. So how did you decide then to start your own company? Because that's a big decision. Um, I've always been entrepreneurial. Um, I found the whole corporate structure at CN. At the time, CN had 35,000 employees. Wow. So big corporate bureaucracy. I found it stifling. Um, my boss would, would irritate me. I'd go to the president of the company and... And, and give him my opinion and here's my case and here's why. It would piss my boss off. Um, and I just knew at some point I was going to start my own business. I just didn't know what it was. But uh, So why did it – so at, the point, at that time it started as EDI? What was the yeah, first – electronic, electronic data interchange was where we started, which is still used in bricks and mortar retail today. So, yeah, we were, we were very early in the EDI. You're very day. technical? Me? No. Yeah, no. No, um, I've got a. Yeah, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna wonder how the hell I got into it. I I did an undergrad degree in prehistoric archaeology in early May. Um, an obvious connection there. An obvious connection. Well, actually, you know what the connection was? I was fascinated by computers, and every Saturday morning we'd go down to the computer stores in Toronto, and we'd you know at the time when the Apple II came out and the early IBM computers. And I was totally fascinated by these things. And I wanted one so bad I couldn't afford it because in those days, like an Apple II was like $3,000. And that was like an enormous amount of money. But that's like ten grand today. And um, I, realized, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't a programmer because I wasn't mathematical. But if I didn't learn how these things worked... I was never going to be able to talk to the people who, um, who, who were going to make these things work. You knew this was the future, though, at some because well, you could tell it was the you future. You could tell. Oh, you could tell. You could tell this was going to totally revolutionize. You know, even doing, even doing. Um, you know, when I did my undergrad degree, we were doing computer cartography, and it was very simple stuff. But you could see the power of what was there, and even today, I mean, I look. I, I, I often say to people, I wish I was 20 years younger because the, the amount of disruption that's going on today and the amount of opportunity is, is phenomenal. Yeah. We, thought, we thought in the early years that it was going to be disruptive, and it was, but it's even more disruptive today. Yeah. Well, part of the reason you see that is because of your experience in the field, though. You know? Yeah, yeah, true. true. Um, and, and you mentioned something um, in our email correspondence, and I wanted to bring this up. Um, is a futurist, uh, futuristic discussion on where retail uh, across all channels is headed. So I wanted to get your take on that. I think it's a, and you led me yeah. right into that one. Yeah, I think what you're seeing, what you're seeing right now, is um, it's not only a, it's a shift in the way people consume. Um, part of it. There's a lot of people that are saying it's being driven by millennials and, and, and the way that they consume. But I think it's even more fundamental than that. Certainly they're, they're one of the, the characteristic cohorts that's, that's ha that, that is having the impact. But what it is, I think, is that there's an underlying technological change that is having a much, much more profound impact on how things are being delivered. And... You know, you can call it the Uberization, you can call it whatever you want, but I think that we're only just seeing the beginning of it. And what what you've got, I mean, I think back on the first cell phone I had, it was like this giant brick that you carried around that had a, f a phone on it with a giant antenna, and man, I thought I was so cool. I could talk for 20 minutes on this thing, <laughs> but the thing weighed 10 pounds, and after a day of carrying around, my arm it's was... good workout. Yeah. yeah, it was a workout. <laughs> But you think of today that we actually have a computer in, in our hands and that process of miniaturization 
and the applications that are running on that, and the way now that we're able to serve up information, the way we're able to do things, I think that that is having a profound impact right across the board. And what that's doing in retail is that it's changing the way people consume, but it's but it's 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 more fundamentally it's changing people's expectations on information. If you think of Think of retailing in the 80s and 90s. You went into the store and you had a minimum wage dough head that was, uh, that was on the shop. Can I help you? I mean, they weren't interested in helping you. Um, half the time, the stock wasn't there. People today, because they have so much information at their fingertips, were going back to that 19th century model of the more boutique kind of store where you know the shop, you knew the shop owner. The shop owner would order stuff because he knew his clientele. And I think that if you look at the way Amazon now serves up information, it's the same kind of idea. My, my grandfather had a country general store. And oh, really? I remember as a kid, yeah. And, and I can remember, he sold everything. He sold screens, he sold glass, nails, food. He was the local butcher. At one point, he even sold coffins. Um, Full and, service. Yeah, it was full service. But he knew every single one of his customers that would come in. He knew if somebody wasn't from the area. Um, and what he had in his store was stuff that his consumers actually wanted to buy. That's no different than what Amazon is serving up today in being able to, to, to give you suggestions. They know what you're interested in. I mean, it's just a change in the way that the technology is built. So we've gone through this process. So to come back to your question, I think what we're, what we're going to see is the, the, the carving out, the hollowing out of the, of the middle um, general store where big box, lots of product to those that can be sold quickly and efficiently as commodities, um, a la Amazon or the Costco. And the high-end, very specialty retailer, where you go and you have a relationship with a retailer, you know you've you've either got a sales rep who's been there for a long time who knows you, you built a relationship with them, or you've got a store where you've got that kind of relationship. They sell the products that you're interested in. They're willing to do special orders for you, and I think you're going to see this commoditization on one side. I mean, it's already there with Amazon and uh, the Costco's. The, the things in the middle, like Sears, I mean, they're going to go by the wayside. Five years, I predict that you're going to see probably half of the existing retailers gone. You're going to see these electronic channels, and you're going to see these more specialty channels. And then you're going to have in the middle... Retailers this, gone like Blockbuster is gone type of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, Sears, Sears, is a, Sears is on a death spiral right now. You, will their online component go away too? With their retail? I don't think that. I think that that's a very, very difficult process to go through to maintain that, that online when your bricks and mortar dies. I think that the, the, the credibility of the brand once the bricks and mortar dies. Has such an impact on the, on the on the e-commerce play that I, I my own personal opinion is I don't think it'll survive. Yeah, I mean I think only the exceptional will survive. I think one of the ones, for example, I think that's that's really interesting and everybody should look at them is Best Buy. Look at the way Best Buy have reinvented themselves. I mean they went from a struggling electronics retailer to a company that now is. I mean, they're pretty creative about some of the stuff that they're doing. Their marketplace in Canada, in the U.S., they shut it down because of the platform they're using. But in Canada, their marketplace is really, really successful. Um, and they've had their growing pains. But they've reinvented their stores. Their stores are now much more that destination. Um, they've gotten away from the, 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 the commission-based sales reps. Their guys are on salaries, you know. Um, so I think I think that I think we're going to see more of that. Um, I think you're you're also going to see much more local retailing, little tiny footprints where somebody's got a shop. They're selling, um, you know, like Goulet pens, for example. 
I think I think that's a good example. I mean, that's a very very niche type of product, and you've got these specialty retailers that are niche. They're not trying to be everything for everybody. So you know, does that answer the question? Yeah, it, I'm just yeah, it does. I'm just curious of like if someone's has an e-commerce business now. What things should they start to look at or do differently because of what you see coming in the future? Like maybe it's not putting energy in Sears.com or whatever. What what are some things they should be on the lookout for or start doing or stop doing because of what you see as a trend? I think the I think the the most important thing to me, and this is really marketing, is what do they represent? You think of people, they get into business and they, they, you know, we have a very 19th century model. I buy a product from you, I mark it up and I sell it to the guy next door. I mean, that's a very 19th century, it's a traditional way of doing business. But I think that the, I think what the consumer is looking for today is much more based around, um, I want to have a relationship with you, I want authenticity from you, I want... I want knowledge, I want expertise. And I mean if you're going to sell a commodity, that's a whole different game. Because that's in that model where I'm buying a product and I'm marking it up and maybe I'm providing some value add in terms of design or something or pack, you know, neat packaging or something else, but it's still a commodity play. And really my margin is very important, but I think that what you've got on the other side is this much more experiential kind of retailing which is and a lot of e-commerce businesses are not commodity based mm -hmm. they're much more of this experiential kind of thing right. and I don't think a lot of them have thought about mm -hmm. what it is that they actually represent I'm gonna more content to type marketing more information like he does the videos and things like that um, I, I'll, yeah. I'll come back to Goulet and his pens I think mm -hmm. I think they really nailed it because they have positioned themselves as absolute experts in the fountain pen world. Their site is fresh. They have a clean customer experience. I've never ordered from them, but I'm just going off of what their website. Mm -hmm. I, I get a sense of, of people who are inspired by what they're doing. I get a sense of people who really love fountain pens. They're not just in business because they you know, they're out there flogging pens. I mean, they're not flogging big pens by any stretch of the imagination. Right. But, but, but there's a – you sense an enthusiasm. And I think that's one of their challenges or one of the challenges they're going to have as they scale and get bigger is to maintain that. That's what a lot of companies don't do. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, you know, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate it. Um, love hearing your take on this. Everyone – I have one last question, but everyone should check out virtuallogistics.ca, virtuallogistics.ca, and check out what Robin and his team are doing. It's pretty cool stuff. And um, so my last question, Robin, is you said you got shot at before. Yeah. yeah. It was in 1994, late 94. Um, one of my last uh, business trips I did with Kanak, I was uh, I was in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, and I was uh, sitting on the balcony of of the Sheraton Hotel overlooking the the hills, having a pizza and a glass of wine. Um, I just come from business trip um, out of out of East Africa, and I was on my way to Saudi Arabia, and this gunfight broke out in the back backyard of the the uh, the hotel like it was in the the property right behind the hotel and the bullets were flying like all over the Jeez. place and um, of course the pizza went flying the glass of wine ended up in the parking lot and I ended up on the ground <laughs> it's not a story I tell very often but yeah that <laughs> that was That's pretty uh, crazy that was my experience with Addis <laughs> well I want to be the first one to thank you Robin this has been hugely valuable people should check out virtuallogistics.ca and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you very much, right. Jeremy. And uh, we will uh, see you in Vegas at yeah. uh, Prosper Show. And anybody listening, uh, we, we will be there. So uh, happy to chat. What I got, you can't buy.
Peaches, you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 